pick your number one goal, the one that juices you the most, and then pick three one-year goals. So pull out four goals, okay? Put them on a separate sheet of paper and write down a paragraph under each one why it's an absolute must. Take the time to do this. The goal itself will not drive you. It's the why that, that it's a must that will drive you. Take the time to do this. I mean, people spend more time planning Christmas than they do designing their lives. This episode brought to you by Suites at Madison. Meeting in conference rooms for rent by the hour, week, month, or year. Suites at Madison, where business gets done. Check them out at www.downtowntampaoffice.com. Now, on to the show. You are listening to the Invest Florida Real Estate Show, covering topics in lending, buy and sell strategies, property management, hot markets, and tips and tools to guide you along the way on your path to real estate success. You want Florida investment real estate talk? You have come to the right place. And now, our hosts, Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Invest Florida Real Estate Show. This is Eric Odom, co-host. Did I say co-host already, Stephen? That was the first time, but you can say it again. I can, okay. Sometimes I get a little bit confused, and particularly last night. You know, there was, a, there was some sort of incident outside of my condo last night with a, a, a driver and somebody else fighting and screaming at like 1.30 in the morning, and I feel like I had to... I, I, I got so woken you, up. You, you go break it up. Woken up, and and then uh, and then I couldn't go back to sleep. And it's just like one of those things that you know, one thirty in the morning, and I didn't go back to sleep until almost four. So, um, gosh, I don't know. It, uh, I feel like somebody hit me with a baseball bat. So I'm, I, I'm thick. I'm thick the, today. I guess missed your thick. beauty sleep. I, I missed my beauty sleep. My ability to be able to focus today has uh, been eroded. But hey. It's all good. I think, I mean, things are going really well. I feel very optimistic about uh, uh, our business this year. Uh, we, we continue to grow our property management. Uh, as you know, folks that listen to us know that we help individuals acquire investment property. Uh, much of the time, we are uh, doing the property management on the back end. We do deal specifically in retail. But I learned something today. Uh, actually, it wasn't today, but this week, Stephen, about piece of retail uh, business on a lease. And uh, it was kind of an eye opener. I've been doing this for years and had never experienced before, but uh, it's kind of shocking. It's the little details in a lease. Yeah. And you know, every lease is going to have a cam fee written in. And uh, what you learned was quite illuminating. So why don't you tell us about it? Right. So, so this is very different from multifamily apartment investing. And that's going to be our episode today. Our episode is going to be, uh, which we'll get into, is on multifamily and goal setting and whatnot. But uh, this, what we're talking about, will happen specifically on retail, sometimes on industrial, uh, and sometimes on office, but it's almost exclusive an issue with retail. Rent is broken out into two components, the actual rent and then the expenses to run the property, the property insurance, maintenance, et cetera. And that's referred to as CAM. Now, this can be great for you, you landlords out there, and if you, you landlords know what, what I'm talking about. Uh, frequently, you can include your fees for yourself uh, and pass that on to the tenant so that you can pay for your property manager that can get included in the lease. You can also pay an asset fee for yourself. That, that, that gets also passed on to the tenants. It's broken out. That's the way the tenants want it because they know that rent can be uh, it, it, particularly the expense side can be a, a place where a lot of garbage is is placed, and so they want to see where those uh, where those expenses are coming from, and they also want the ability to be able to audit. So you can make money at it out of it. It can be an additional source of cash flow for you, but you have to be fair and reasonable about it because it can be audited on the back end. I I didn't know that typically when there is a, how CAM is divided up. Let's say, for example, you have a hundred thousand square foot plaza. If somebody has a twenty-five thousand square feet of that hundred thousand feet plaza, they're responsible for twenty-five percent of the entire of the cost of the maintenance of the maintenance and the property insurance of everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what happens when there is twenty-five percent is vacant of a property? 
In other words, what happens to the tenants um, who are in a plaza and the plaza is not completely full? Yeah. How do the expenses the get expenses allocated? Get passed on? Well, the, typically, and the way I have always seen it, is that the landlord is responsible for that because he has control over that property. And that seems to be what's the most just to me. But again, with retail, there's a lot of shenanigans that can be pulled in the lease. And this is can be positive for the landlord, but I think that there is a line that should be drawn in terms of what is ethical and what's not. And in this particular situation, and we're taking over this uh, building and the lease, this is how the lease was rent was list was written, is that it is rentable and rented. So rentable is the hundred thousand feet. But in this particular instance, the example that I use, the rented space is 75,000 square feet. So the plaza is assumed to be a 75,000 square foot plaza, not a 100,000 square foot plaza. And if you guys didn't understand the math from that, it just sort of like listening to me, now that vacant 25,000 square feet, that portion of the expenses are being split and shared among the other tenants, really at, at, at no fault of their own. They there, there should be somebody in there. Maybe the landlord's not been completely... Yeah, the, you would expect the landlord to be responsible for vacant space, and now the tenants have to pitch in yeah. and, and pick up their proportionate share. Yeah. So so anyway, I mean, this is just one example. Uh, I, my personal feeling is I'm not really comfortable with that relationship because I think it creates a lot of ill will. At the end of the day, you have to deal with a tenant and you want to make sure that, you know, you want a long-term relationship with these people. If you're going to try to scrape a few dollars off the table uh, at the expense of of having that tenant for a long term, it's going to end up costing you a lot more. But but from the tenant's point of view, something else. Check the lease. Does it say rented yeah. square feet or does it say rentable square feet? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know, we're talking mostly to 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 uh landlords here and owners here. Be fair. That that's the that's the you can there's all sorts of ways that you can uh, uh, take advantage and I don't want to use that's a pretty harsh term but there's all kinds of ways that you can um, scrape additional funds additional revenues for yourself off of the uh, the camp portion but if you're unfair and it's unjust and it can't be explained to the tenant there's a good chance you're going to lose that tenant and if you're empty for three months or six months trying to re refill that space, you're paying for it one way or another. So I think the best practice is to do the right thing and be just with people and you'll maintain long-term relationships with your, with your tenants. And I think that's, that's, that's the idea. Um, enough of that though, Stephen, we've got a great guest today. It's a little different because you and I typically do a back and forth with with individuals, right. right? Now we have somebody today who has really something to say and, and he's a he's a success story and he's happy to share his wisdom and his experience with all of us. So it'll be an opportunity for us and for our listeners. Exactly. It was an in-person interview. It really wasn't an interview. What he asked us to do was just to get out of his way and let him talk. And we were happy to do that. He certainly is a very proficient public speaker does a lot of motivational and, uh, talks and discussions on how to invest in multifamily. So Stephen and I will mostly be absent from this episode besides it, doing the introduction and the uh, and, and then saying goodbye and hello to you guys. I mean, I think that's uh, that's kind of it. And then our, our speaker will, will take over from there. But before we get into the show, I wanted to thank Robert Doms. He reviewed the Invest Florida show on the Google Play Store. He said, great discussion on real estate investment. Robert gave us a five-star review. Robert, really appreciate that. It's very helpful for us when we're trying to solicit guests that people leave reviews. These guests, they, they're not, there's, many of them are doing this because they want to do it. But many of them also want to make sure that it's a good investment of their time and that maybe there's an opportunity for them to get some sort of business relationship out, out of the discussion. And when you guys leave reviews, such as Robert did, it helps us. So if you listeners, if you've not done that, we're we're asking you to please, it helps you too, because it helps with the quality and the ability of us to be able to get quality uh, speakers on. So if you've not left a review on the Google Play Store or on iTunes, please do that now. It would be uh, greatly appreciated in the end. You also benefit from that. Stephen, anything else before we get to rolling into our, into our guest? 
I think Rod will have a lot to say, and it should be a little bit longer than usual, but we'll learn a lot, so let's get right into it. Rod Cleef is a passionate real estate investor who has personally owned and managed over 2,000 apartments and homes. As one of the country's top real estate business and peak performance luminaries, Rod has built over 22 businesses in his 40-year business career, several of which have been worth tens of millions of dollars. Rod has a compelling rags-to-riches story. He soared from humble's beginnings as a young, impoverished Dutch immigrant to incredible success. He has combined his passion for real estate investing with his personal philosophy of goal-setting, envisioning, and manifesting success to become one of America's top real estate investment and high-performance life coaches. Rod has built several multi-million dollar businesses. Giving back to the community is a major passion for Rod. He is founder and long-serving president of Tiny Hands Foundation. It's a children's charitable foundation, and he also leads Back to School Backpack Brigade, which provides thousands of backpacks and school supplies to children in need, and Teddy Bear Brigade, and the Holiday Basket Brigade, which provides thousands of holiday gift baskets of food and Christmas toys annually. Rod, welcome to the Invest Florida Show. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Hey, guys, welcome. Uh, a lot of happy, smiling faces. Uh, so I, immig- I immigrated to this country when I was six years old with my brother Albert and my mother's Vancha and ended up in Denver, Colorado, where I spent the next 30 years. Didn't have much money, uh, wore clothes from the Goodwill, uh, ate expired food, um, you know, drank powdered milk because that's all we could afford. And I know a lot of people had it a lot harder than we did, but I knew I wanted more. And my mom babysat kids so we'd have enough money to eat. And with her babysitting money, she bought the house across the street from us when I was 14 for $30,000. And when I was 17, she told me that that house had gone up $20,000 while she slept. I'm like, what? What? She made twenty grand, did not have to do anything. And I was right then and there, I said, I'm getting into real estate. So I got my broker's license like within days of turning 18. Back then, you could get your broker's license with education. You didn't have to have experience. So I got my broker's license. I was going to be rich in real estate. Got a bus bench, put it down at the end of the street with my picture on it because that's what realtors do. Of course, didn't get any business from it, but it made my mom really proud. Uh, but First year, I made maybe $8,000 in real estate. Um, second year, maybe nine or $10,000. But my third year, I made over $100,000, which back in 81 was a decent chunk of change. And so what happened between year two and year three? What happened was I started dating a girl. Her name was Kim McKinney, and she had a dad named Gino. And Gino was bigger than life. He was in real estate, and I spent a lot of time at their house. And you know how... You experience, well, let me tell you about their house, okay? So it had a pool. Never seen a pool in a house before. It had a three car garage. I couldn't even imagine a three car garage. They had Corvettes. They had a Lincoln Continental. They had, you know, all the toys, the jet skis, a boat, and motorcycles. And, you know, once you experience something, and I spent a lot of time there, you know, once you experience something, you don't want to go backwards. And so, you know, I experienced that. Plus, Gino taught me about, started my education about the psychology of success, how mindset really is 80% of your success in anything. 20% is what you guys come here to learn, the real estate stuff. And so uh, within a year, I had a condo, I had a Corvette, and and life was great. Um, Fast forward 20 years, I... Always wanted to live on the beach, okay? I lived, I, we were in Denver. There's no beaches in Denver. And uh, so I, I actually rented a house in uh, Sarasota, Florida on a canal. And I'd never seen anything like that before, where you could take a boat from your backyard out to the ocean. I mean, that was just unthinkable to me. And I told a friend that I rented it from, man, I said, I always wanted to live on the beach, but, you know, this is really cool. And he said, well, you should go check out Casey Key because there you can have the beach on one side and, and boats on the backside. And so I uh, ended up building a house on the beach there, um, 10,000 square feet, uh, in a spectacular home. Uh, it was, uh, you know, three stories. It had a waterfall from the second floor balcony into the pool. I mean, it had a $150,000 aquarium around the, the staircase. And I had all the toys. I did, I, you know, I, I 
been focused on success, and I had all the toys. I had the Mercedes, the Maserati, you know, and, and boats and jet skis and all those things. And then in January of 2000, I, I was there with my beautiful wife, me, Lynn, and my children, my, my daughter, Alex, and my son, Miles. And so it's January of 2000, and I bring my kids into the living room, and my daughter, Alex, is nine, and we sit them on the couch. My wife's on one end, and I'm on the other end. And remember, this whole time, I'd been focused on success. That's all I cared about was success. And I look at my daughter, Alex, and I say, sweetheart, I love you very much, and this has nothing to do with you, but mom and I are getting a divorce. And she started screaming, no, no, daddy, no, daddy, no. And she was crying and screaming. And then my son, Miles, was confused. And he's, uh, you know, con- didn't know what was going on. What's wrong, Alex? What's wrong? And no, daddy, no. And so finally we get her quieted down. And I go downstairs into one of the bedrooms on the main floor and started crying. I hadn't cried in a decade. And I couldn't stop crying. Fast forward two or three weeks. My wife's attorney had me kicked out of the house. And I left all my belongings, this giant house, and all my stuff with this. I left it behind. I had a suitcase with the clothes in it. I ended up in a bedroom at my brother's house that was smaller than the closet that I, my closet in the main house. Fast forward till Thanksgiving of that year. I had finally had visitation. I could get my kids. I pull up to this house that I'd built. And I'm looking through this big gate, and there's, you know, I see my wife's boyfriend with the shirt off with tattoos all over, walking around like he owned the place. Nothing against tattoos, but it, it didn't feel good. Anyway, so so fast forward to 2006. I, I was worth about $50 million. My net worth in 2006 went up $17 million while I slept. And if you want to do the math on that, it's about 8000 an hour. Of course, I did that. You know, you know how when you get a big head, you know, God has a habit of smacking you down? Well, that was 2008. I lost everything. Everything's in foreclosure. Um, I'm the guy that bought foreclosures, and I'm in foreclosure on everything that I own. So, and then finally, at late 2008, I'm sitting in my living room and I see my Mercedes being towed away. And that was the last bit of stuff that I had in my life. And I just started laughing because I mean, what else? What else are you going to do? And you know how sometimes your worst moment can be your best moment? Because here I am, a decade later, and I've got all the stuff back. I've got a compound on the water, beautiful, amazing place, six buildings and guest house on the water, giant main house, a media building with an exercise room and a media room and five-car garage. And because God's got a sense of humor, I, I can see my old house across the bay there where I used to live. And I've got all the stuff back. But this time, I'm focused on my relationships. I'm focused on balance. I'm focused on the relationships with my beautiful wife, my children, my coaching students, my foundation, and I've never been so happy in my life. I've got a magnificent life, and I'm an expert at teaching people about real estate. I'm an expert at making money in real estate, but a lot of people can do that. The difference with me is I don't let you lose sight of your soul. I don't let you lose sight of what's most important, your relationships, your balance, your health. So thank you for letting me share my story. Um, Let's talk about multifamily real estate. That's why you're here. Actually, let's talk. Before I do that, let's talk about, if you'll humor me, how I recovered from losing $50 million because it's kind of timely. We're here in January, and and I recovered. And a lot of people don't recover from something like that. I mean, I, you know, I, I thought... 80 million baby boomers getting old and getting cold. I was set for life. You know, I had 800 houses, had multiple apartment complexes. I mean, who would have thunk it, you know? And the reason I recovered is because I knew what I wanted and I knew why I wanted it. So let me take a minute, if you don't mind. I hadn't actually planned it, scripted any of this. But why don't I tell you about an exercise I take my coaching students through, which is like a goal-setting exercise. But I'll give it a little framework because it's like it's January. It's perfect timing for this. So what I recommend that you do is, well, let me back up, actually. Let's talk about visualization and manifesting first. 
So I was 18, I had my broker's license, and I bought this four-door Granada, this silver Granada. It's the ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life. And if you work for Ford, I apologize, but, but you know too. It's ugly. So I told you I met Gino, and he had a Corvette. I got a picture of a Corvette, and I put it on the visor of this four-door Granada. And, and within a year, I had that Corvette. Um, and didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I was actually manifesting things into my life. Um, and then these are just car examples. And by the way, this is not me bragging. This is just me sharing my story. Please, these things that I'm going to describe to you, I don't, they don't even interest me anymore. But I, let me preframe that by saying that. So back then was the, um, the, the TV show Magnum PI was on. It was a, the guy's name was Tom Selleck, and he drove this beautiful Ferrari 308. And I, always, I thought that was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. So I got a picture of that actual car and put it on the visor of my Corvette. Within a couple of years, I had a Maserati. It looked just like that, uh, Ferrari. And then the last example I'll give you is I'm the guy that always wanted a Lamborghini. I had the posters on the wall of the Lamborghinis with the bikini girls, and yeah, that was me. And what's ironic is my son collected models of exotic cars, and he had about 30 of them, and he had a model of the exact same color on style Lamborghini I ended up getting, which ultimately wrecked. But that's another story. But so visualization and manifesting works, okay? So I want to preface the goal-setting chat with that first, okay? And, and I manifested that house on the beach. I mean, I dreamt about that for years uh, and, and made that happen with pictures of palm trees. And So don't underestimate the power of that, I guess, is my point. So goal-setting. Um, what I recommend you do is you pick an hour. When you're uninterrupted, you have a lot of energy, and whether that's the morning for you or the evening for you, whenever that is for you, and don't have a meal right before then, sit down and write down everything you could ever possibly want in life. Not just the list of 10 things that are on your goal list now. I mean everything, okay? The big things, the little things. Take the lid off your brain and write down, you know, obviously the material things, the cars, the boats, the jet skis, all that stuff but also what you want to learn. Write down what you want to learn. Write down who you want to help. Um, everything. I mean, I want to learn how to fly helicopters. I want to learn how to play drums. My wife was kind enough to buy me a drum set a couple years ago. I have not learned how to play it yet. But what do you want to learn? Write that down. Then write down, you know, maybe you want to help your family. I bought my parents a house. Who do you want to help? Write down, um, and then all the material stuff, obviously the, the dollar amount on how much you want. Clarity is power. Make sure it's clear and measurable. You know, how much money you want to make a month, how much money you want in the bank. Once you've written down everything and you can't think of another thing, and if you're analytical, don't analyze it. You can scratch it out later. Just keep writing till you can't stop. Once you've written down everything you can think of, put a time limit on each goal because it's not a goal until it's measurable. So put how many years it's going to take you to achieve it. One, three, five, ten, twenty. And remembering that as human beings, we'll overestimate what we can accomplish in a year and then massively underestimate what we can do in five or ten years. So keep that in mind when you're measuring your, or uh, putting a time limit on your goals. Then this is where most people stop there. But the next couple of pieces are the most important. Pick your number one goal, the one that juices you the most, and then pick three one-year goals. So pull out four goals, okay? Put them on a separate sheet of paper and write down a paragraph under each one why it's an absolute must. Take the time to do this. The goal itself will not drive you. It's the why that, that it's a must that will drive you. Take the time to do this. I mean, people spend more time planning Christmas than they do designing their lives. Please take the time. It's worth it. Once you've written down why it's an absolute must, use powerful language. Words are very powerful. You know, so, you know I can show my family what success looks like so I can do you know, whatever I want, wherever I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want, whatever it is, write it down, whatever's going to juice you, and then do one little tiny step beyond that and write down some negative reasons why it's an absolute must. So I don't feel like a failure. So I don't fail my family. Be hard on you. Be painful. Because as human beings, we'll do more to avoid pain than gain pleasure. So put some pain in there, okay? Then the last step. Get some pictures. Go on Google. Find some pictures that resonate with you, associated with your goals. You look at them like, ooh, yeah, I like that. That stirs me. Download them. Go to Walgreens or CVS. Have them blown up and put them somewhere you're going to see them. I have a planner, and I should have brought it so I could show you guys. I wish I'd have thought of it. 
I use a paper planner. And in the back of this thing, I've got pictures that have been in there for 19 years. First pictures are my gratitude pictures. They're, you know, everything starts from a place of gratitude. After that, I've got the goals that I wanted. I've got that, that, those houses that I wanted on the beach that I got. I've got the, the Lamborghini pictures in there, the watches, things that don't matter to me anymore, the Rolls Royce, all these things that I got because I have pictures, okay? So trust me, this stuff works, guys. I know some of you may be thinking, oh, this is all woo-woo, but I promise you it works. Um, and, uh, and that's how I got through it. That's how I got, I, I, you know, because I picked myself back up. I knew what I wanted. I, know why I, I knew why I wanted it, and I got back in the saddle and, and got to work. So multifamily real estate investing. Multifamily real estate investing is a team sport, okay? It's if you're buying multifamily two to four units, it's residential, and they're going to look at you personally, and you're going to have to qualify for the loan yourself, and they're going to value the property based on comparable sales. But once you go over five units, it's commercial, and it becomes a team sport. And what's exciting about that is you can supplement anything, anywhere you're deficient with other people on your team. So, for example, when you go to get a loan on a commercial multifamily property, they're going to look for net worth, they're going to look for liquidity, and they're going to look for experience. You can find one person that meets all those requirements Bring him onto your team or her onto your team, and you can go get loans. You can attract investors. You can get partners. There's all sorts of things you can do. Um, so what you're doing, when you, the first thing you do is you do kind of a self-analysis, and you just kind of assess your strengths and your weaknesses, and you look for deficiencies, and you look for you know what you need to shore up. So that's number one, okay? And what's exciting about commercial real estate is, they have what's called non-recourse loans. Every, you guys know what that means. It means that if they foreclose, I wish I'd have known what that meant back in 2008, <laughs> but that means if they foreclose, they can't take anything but the property, okay? And what's exciting about that is it's not hard to get someone to be a, what, what they call a sponsor for you, okay? A sponsor would be someone you bring in that's got those three requirements met. Maybe they've got 100 units or something. They've got the liquidity, the net worth, and the experience, and they'll sign on the loan because there's no ramification to them if the, if the deal goes south. It's like you're giving them a gift. If you find the deal, you're not going to have a hard time finding someone to step into that capacity. and give them, You give them a small piece, and, or you bring them onto your team to lend credibility to yourself. For example... Um, I've got a couple of branding websites, I call them. I, you brand yourself in this business. You give yourself some legitimacy and some authority. And one of them is remequitygroup.com. Another one is mhpmanagementgroup.com for mobile home parks. Now, I don't own a mobile home park. Um, my brother owns several. My good friend Kevin owns a bunch. But, you know, don't get me wrong. I can find one, fix it, and manage it in my sleep. But I don't have to prove that to somebody, okay? I don't want to have to... Uh, you know, have to prove myself to a broker or a seller or, a, you know, a lender or potential investors that I want to bring in. So I've got my buddy Kevin on my team on that website for the experience component. Is this making sense? Okay, so this is what you want to do in this business. You put a team together that brings those pieces together so you can go out there to the world and, you know, bring down deals, uh, you know, be credible enough to attract, uh, to get a broker to respond to you to get an investor to get interested in you, and that's how you do it. Next thing you do is you, you have to pick what size uh, property you're going to go after and pick a market. Uh, I like to tell people that there are four markets I would consider first if I were starting out. And those four markets are your backyard, and I consider your backyard anywhere within a two-hour drive. Um, somewhere you, you uh, spend some time or you know, live maybe went to college or whatever. That'd be a second choice as an option. Third would be somewhere you have boots on the ground. You have family or friends, and then the fourth would be uh, somewhere that you'd like to visit or maybe retire. So those would be the first four options I would consider for a market. If you're not going to stick with the Tampa market here, um, and then as far as the size, I would. I really think there's a sweet spot under 40 units right now. You know, if you go above 40 units, um, you've got a lot more competition and it's institutional competition. And if you stay in the 5 to 30 or 40 unit range, you're dealing with mom and pop sellers. Um, they're not as sophisticated and you're not dealing with 
too many institutional players. There's not as much competition. There's still a lot of competition in this market. There's a ton right now, but it's still there's not as much in that in that uh, area. So that's my suggestion. Um, but then once you uh, select a property, or I'm sorry, once you select an area, then you need to start developing relationships. And I'd recommend the first two groups of people I would go after would be property managers and brokers. I would reach out to property managers and reach out to brokers. Now, you want property managers that are mar that are managing the size and type property that you're interested in. You're not, you don't want to talk to people that are you know, doing 200 units for your 10 unit. Uh, but you can ask them questions like, you know, where's an area I wouldn't want to collect rent at night? Or, you know, if, if you don't know the area, that, that this is, this is, I'm assuming you don't know the area with these questions. You know, uh, where's the path of progress? Is there any area that's gentrifying? I mean, let me tell you, if you find an area that's gentrifying, incredible opportunity. I bought a fourplex in, uh, in Denver back in the day for 80 grand. Two story units, 1500 square feet, three bedroom, two bath units, 80 grand. It's probably worth two million right now. Yeah, and I sold. Yeah. Uh, so you know, gentrifying areas are the are fantastic if you can find them. So, um, but you ask you ask the property manager those questions. But what you're doing is you're putting your team together. You're building relationships, and you don't want a lot of relationships, but you want quality relationships. Okay. I mean, you want to know as you start. Let me back up. If you're going to do this business, the multifamily game, be in it for the long game. This is not a get-rich-quick thing. This is a become very wealthy over time thing, but play the long game. And so develop relationships for the long game. And, I mean, get to know how many kids they have, what they like. That's the depth of relationship you want to have with these different people on your team. So you're going to start with property managers, then brokers, obviously. Go on LoopNet, find brokers that are... Um, Marketing the size and type property that you're interested in, reach out to them on a particular property, and start the relationship. Uh, I would recommend that you've got a bit of a feel for how to evaluate a deal properly first, because the best way to develop a relationship with a broker is, is it mostly brokers in here? Oh, okay, okay. So the best way to develop a deal with a broker is, is to show, that, especially in this hot market, you have to be taken seriously, and that's kind of hard. Because, you know, brokers are the bell of the ball right now. That'll change when the market contracts. But right now, they're the bell of the ball. So you, you, want, you have to be noticed. So, by the way, I'd recommend sending them a handwritten thank you note after you meet with them. Pro or talk to them, property managers, brokers. Um, set yourself apart because that's, they can make you wealthy, okay? Uh, so, so you want to you develop those relationships. But go on LoopNet. See who's, who's, who's uh, got a properties in the size and type that you're interested in. and then. When they send you a deal, you want to be responsive and ideally be able to show them that you analyzed it and tell them why it didn't make sense. And then they're going to take you seriously. So do a little homework first. Evaluate some deals first and, and so that you can be credible when you're developing those relationships. Um, and I'll give you some tips on evaluating deals here in a second. But... So you, you start that relationship with a broker and you're going for the depth of the relationship. You're, you're, again, you're, this is, this is going to be a lifelong, these are lifelong relationships and that's the mindset that you have to have. Um, I, the next would be bankers. Find local bankers in whatever area you're interested in. And I'm not talking about Bank of America, BB&T, Fifth Third, Wells Fargo, Chase, none of those guys. I'm talking about regional banks. Okay. And call them and say, do you do multifamily investing? Uh, okay, you do. Great. Who's the person? Talk to that person, and just say, you know, what sort of, you know, what sort of loans have you made in the past on multifamily? Uh, what sort of loan to value do you do you have? What sort of term? Um, and and just start the relationship, and then just um, as soon as possible, if you're a man, put a jacket on. If you're a lady, put a business suit on, and go in and meet them. Go have a cup of coffee with them. Go take them to lunch. Get, let them see you. Let them see your integrity, your passion, and and start that relationship. If you can, open a bank account there. They love those, you know, banking relationships. To tell you the value of this, I interviewed a guy up in Michigan. He was young, like in his 20s, and it was quite a while ago when I first started the podcast, and 
He bought a million dollar property. I remember it was 20 units. It was a million bucks. And because of the relationship he had with the bank, he got it for $5,000 down. Okay, because the, the seller allowed him to carry. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the bank allowed the seller to carry. And, and so that's the value of those relationships. Okay, bankers, brokers, property managers. Um, after you've really honed in on an area, you, you really like it. Uh, it's, it makes sense. You're going to stick with that area. You bought a property there maybe, or you're really seeing a lot of opportunity there. I highly recommend you do a direct-to-seller campaign. And what I mean by that is you do a mailer, okay? You, and I'm not talking about thousands of letters. I'm talking about maybe a few hundred. Um, the, the average response rate on direct mail is probably 1%. Definitely less than two percent. If you're if you get two percent, you're doing backflips. But it, the average is 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 probably less than one percent. Our av our average is six to nine percent, and I'm not exaggerating. Hundred letters, six to nine phone calls, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you some some secrets because we do what other people aren't willing to do. And I will tell you, if you are willing to do what other people aren't willing to do, you'll be a success. I mean, I wasn't making money my second year in real estate. I met Gino. Gino suggested I go knock on doors of people that are in foreclosure, and I did it. For almost a decade, I bought 500 houses and multiple apartment buildings by knocking on the door and saying, hey, I'm Rod Cleef. Saw you having a little trouble with countrywide funding. You know, I help people in this situation. You know, you want to chat about it and, and doing what other people aren't willing to do. Um, and the mailing example, I'll give you some tips on that. We target people that have owned at least 10 years, if not even 20 years. and we do that for a reason. I'll tell you why in a second. But, and then most people, if they do a mailer, they'll buy a list from a list broker, okay? They'll buy a list from a list broker. If they're really ambitious, they might download it at the assessor's office, but that's only if it's easy. If it's hard, they won't even do that. And I, I'm here to tell you the harder it is, the better the opportunity is because that means nobody's doing it, okay? And so we always download from the assessor's office. Then we... Um, what, you're, what you'll find is that most of the properties, five units or up, are owned in entities. They're owned in LLCs or corporations. Okay, that's, that's just how, how you do it in the commercial real estate space. You use an entity. And if you mail to that registered agent of that entity, well, you can imagine what happens to the mail, right? What we do is we look up every one of those at the Secretary of State's office. We find out who the principals are, and we mail them at their home address. Who does this? Nobody does this. And that's why we have such success. But we don't do it ourselves. I have virtual assistants in the Philippines that help us do that. And so, again, doing what other people aren't willing to do. Now, we also do some tricks with the letters and the envelopes. But I interviewed these guys on my podcast, um, Sterling and Jacob. And these two guys are in Indianapolis. And they, when I interviewed them, they had a, they had just closed on a, 46 unit that they found by driving around and looking for rundown properties, looking them up at the assessor's office and, ca and calling those owners and saying, hey, do you want to sell? And you guys are thinking, well, duh, that's simple, you know, and it is, and nobody does it, okay? So, because it's doing what other people aren't willing to do. These same guys had a 50 unit under contract that I know they've now closed on. In fact, they're coming to my live event here in Tampa next week. And they found it by calling for rent ads on Craigslist and saying, hey, are you interested in uh, selling? Again, doing what other people aren't willing to do. Now, I'll tell you, we've got VAs in the Philippines that we pay $3 and $5 an hour that speak English better than me. Okay, They sound like they're from the Midwest. You'd never know they're from the Philippines. And we're going to have, as soon as we're doing a mailing campaign, and they're, the only reason I have eight of them is because we're doing the whole United States, and we're almost done getting ready for this. And, yeah, I'll probably be mailing about 5,000 mobile home parks next week and apartments. But, um, like I said, two of them speak English fantastic. So as soon as, as soon as they're done with that mailing campaign, I'm going to put them on the phones for two hours a night, six bucks or ten bucks a night, and have them call and say, hey, you know, my boss saw your, for rent, your, your uh, ad for rent, and he needs to buy a place. You know, he wanted me just to call and see if you ever thought about selling. If you have, I'll set up a call with you and him. I mean, hello, is that like 
easiest thing you can imagine, and you've got leads coming. And it, but it's doing what other people aren't aren't willing to do. But I'm leveraging that, so it's nothing you can't do yourselves. Um, what else? Okay, then if you do a mailer, you want to be very good at talking to sellers. You want to be very good at explaining seller financing. By the way, I've got a free book. If anybody wants it, just text the my name Rod to four one four one one. It's two hundred pages. It's like a textbook for this business. There's no fluff. It's and I've got a companion course that that that's uh, going to go along with it as well. So it's kind of a no brainer. It's free. Um, but all right, awesome. Um, also, while I'm on a roll here, I've also got a multifamily Facebook group that's got 5,000 people in it now. And you just go to multifamilycommunity.com and it's a direct link. So you're crazy not to join that community because, again, like here, you're around like-minded people. And the more you immerse yourself in this, the more you surround yourself with people that are doing this, the faster you ramp yourself. And it's all about relationships, guys. So you develop relationships. And I will tell you, at these meetings like this, there are... A lot of people that come that never pull the trigger. They never take action because of fear or limiting beliefs or whatever, but they have money. And so they will invest with you if you develop relationships with them. So please don't underestimate the power of groups like this and, you know, even, you know, um, and, and like the one I have on Facebook. So anyway, those are two free resources. Seller financing is the bell of the ball. If you can get seller financing, that's always the best way to go. If you do a mailer to people that have owned 20 years, chances are they're going to be retired, okay? If they're retired, they're not going to take that money they make from the property they sell and put it into another high-risk investment. It's going to go in the bank. Um, and if they've owned it for 20 years, it's likely fully depreciated. So they're not going to get all the, they're not going to be able to keep it all. They'll, they'll likely keep 65 to 70 cents on the dollar. So you want to be very good at having a conversation, something like this. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I'm buying your property for a million dollars. You're only, you realize because you're fully depreciated, you're only going to get to keep 65, 70 cents on the dollar. And when you put that 650 or $700,000 in the bank, here's what your payment will be. Now, if you work with me, I'll, Give you enough of a down payment so you know I'm serious, but I'll pay you three, four, five, six percent interest, and you don't pay taxes. You're only going to pay taxes on the amount you receive every year, so your payment from me is going to be three or four times what you'll get from the bank. But you want to be congruent at having a conversation like that, okay? Because there's, like I say, there's nothing better than seller financing. Um, okay, market rents. If you're going into an area that you don't fully understand, it's very, very important that you accurately calculate market rents. And what I mean by this is, let's say you find a 25 unit in Ocala. Okay, it's all two bedroom units, and your first, your natural inclination is going to be to go on Apartments.com, rent bits, Rentometer, Craigslist, Zillow. You're going to look and see what two bedrooms are renting for, right? Hello? Yeah, thank you. So I want to make sure you're still with me. All right. And and that would not nearly be enough. And here's, here's what I mean by that. You have to make sure you're checking apples to apples. Because, I mean, the obvious things, like you've got to compare it against similar size units, similar age, you know, similar area or similar type area. But the not so obvious things, like similar amenities. Like let's say the one, the the, the 25 unit you're looking at is separately metered and all the tenants pay all their own utilities. And you compare it to one where the owner pays water or the owner maybe that's got a boiler or something and they even pay heat. That can be a, if it's water, it can be a $50 a month swing. If they pay heat, it can be a $100 a month swing in rent, okay? Same thing with the washer dryer hookups. If, if, if the unit you're looking at has washer dryer hookups and the one you compare it to don't, that's a $50 a month swing. To give you an idea of the ramification of that, commercial real estate, is valued based on a multiple of the net income, the net operating income. The, the better you get, the more you raise the rents, the, the more you decrease the expenses, exponentially increases the value. So if you have a $50 swing on a 25 unit property, if you raise the rents, for example, 50 bucks on a 25 unit property, all things being equal, you've just raised the value to $250,000. Okay, that's how big a deal it is. So you don't want to mess up the market rent calculation, okay? All right. 
Uh, what else? If you're going to do this business, it's a good idea to get up to speed on syndications, okay? Now, at a high level, you have a partnership or you have a syndication. And a partnership is, let's say, two or three of you guys in here get together, you buy a property, and maybe you all play a little role, maybe you all sign on the debt. But you're all in, involved in some fashion. That's a partnership. A syndication, if, if you take money from someone and you just give them a return, it's a syndication. And you got to stroke the check for the for the SEC documents. Do not screw around with that. You don't want the SEC knocking on your door, which won't happen unless the deal goes south, but don't risk it. Okay, so just do the paperwork. You can get them done fairly reasonably, um, but you want to you dot the I's and cross the T's. Now, don't be scared of syndication. There's a lot of ways to make money in a syndication, okay? For example, um, you, have a, you can charge an acquisition fee. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'll take 50% of something over 100% of nothing any day. Are you with me? Yes? All right. All right, so, so syndications are awesome, and they're awesome because you can put that team together. You can find that sponsor. You can, you know, put... Put, bring in a broker, bring in a property manager, put a team together, get that credibility so that investors will take a look at you. And if you find the deals, you're going to find the money right now. There's so much money out there looking for deals, it's crazy. So, um, But with a syndication, you can charge an acquisition fee, for example. And it's typically 3%. Can be I've seen as high as 5% regularly. Okay, On a million-dollar deal, that's 30 to 50 grand. Okay? Um, you can charge an asset management fee to manage that property for the life of the the lifetime that you own it. Okay, and it's you know two percent is very normal, uh, and that's not property management. That's asset management. That's what you get to manage the property manager. Okay, so there's ways to make money on a syndication besides just that piece of equity that you get. So don't don't underestimate uh, you know the the uh, the lucrative nature of this business. Um, Okay, syndication. You you are going to want to have to get you are going to want to get up to speed on recourse versus non-recourse debt. Recourse meaning what I had in 08, uh which, you know, crushed me. Uh where you're personally liable, non-recourse where you're not. Now, non-recourse sounds great, but there are some disadvantages as well. The big one is uh very high prepayment penalties, okay? And so you don't want to put a, it's called agency debt, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You don't want to put a non-recourse loan on something you're going to sell in three years, for example, usually. You're going to want to do a bridge loan and then refinance into this long-term fantastic agency debt, you know, with no personal liability. Um, so, but you're going to want to get up to speed on that. So, you, you know, talk to a broker, get up to speed on that. And... Um, the, the you want to you'll you'll want to understand what needs to go into a loan package. You're going to want to uh, you know understand what the upfront fees are. Now I'm going to recommend any of you that are going to get into this business don't use your personal money for equity. Use your personal money for operational purposes. Use your money to you know pay the upfront fees for for the loans to you know to put the deals together to pay for the due diligence. Bring in investors to do the deals. If you find the deals, you'll find the money. I mean, I just brought somebody into my coaching program with $9 million, and the only reason he joined was to have access to my students to joint venture on deals. There's so much money out there right now. So, you know, focus on finding the deals. Focus on immersing yourself in this business and learning this business because it's a fantastic business. And, and let me tell you, we're heading into a contraction. I mean, it's not if, it's when. It's 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 going to happen. You know, Kiyosaki's been quoted as, as that it's already started, but but it's coming. And there will be exponential opportunities in multifamily real estate if you get up to speed now so you're ready, you're poised and ready to jump when the market contracts. I mean, I've interviewed people on my podcast that, you know, started in 09 and 10 that have thousands of units right now because, you know, they were able to get bank repos. You know, they had some cash and they had the connections. They built up, you know, a list, you know, they'd gone out, found investors and, you know, built up that network and went out there and, you know, if somebody stood still long enough, talked about how excited they were about real estate, did an elevator pitch, you know, and told them what they're doing, and and they were poised, ready to go. So learn this now so you're ready to go when that happens. Me, I was, you know, in a foxhole with my hands over my head trying to recover and lick my wounds in 08 and 09 because I was being crushed. But um, otherwise, you know, I would have capitalized on it. So don't miss that opportunity. Um 
Okay, loans. Let's talk about let's talk about due diligence for a second. So the way commercial real estate works, if you don't know, residential, you put a property under contract, you'll have a financing contingency typically. You might have a weasel clause that's you know, you'll you'll have an inspection period, but it's you know, and then you inspect it and if you don't like it, you can back out or you make requests. In commercial, it's it's similar but different. In commercial, you'll put a property under contract. And then you'll have what's called a due diligence period. And in that due diligence period, um, you will um, have typically 30 days, and it's, even in this hot market, sometimes it's quite a bit less than that even now, uh, just to be competitive, before your money's at risk, before your money goes hard, they call it, okay? And during that 30 days, you're going to go check out the property, you're going to go check the leases, you're going to go check the contracts, you're going to you know, have it inspected and all these other things. Well, if you're looking at lots and lots of properties to find that one deal and you find that 25 unit in Ocala, for example, and you've looked at 100 properties and you, this thing looks right and it checks off all the boxes and you're excited and you get it under contract and you're cartwheeling the whole way home, well, at that very moment, you need to take a deep breath and put on the hat that says, why do I not want to do this deal? And it is a real mindset shift that you must make. See, as, as human beings, when we make a decision, it's human nature to look for reasons to bolster that decision, to support that decision, to substantiate that decision, because we want to be right. You can't do that here. You have to take a shift. Now, let me give you an example. I have, I have a five-person acquisition team, and I've got... Um, Two young guys on that team, James and William. And uh, James is the one that manages my virtual assistants. He did those screen share videos in my course, did a great job with it. They're both young and in their early 20s, and they're both very hungry. They get incentivized if they find a deal. They get equity if they find a deal. They are hungry, okay? In fact, visualize them as a couple of Dobermans with slobber coming out of their mouth over here, okay? That's, that's James and William. Now I've got a Robert. Robert's my CFO. He's a CPA. He's done $100 million worth of multifamily deals. Um, could possibly be the most boring guy on the planet. I hope he doesn't hear this. <laughs> but he's brilliant. Okay? Now visualize him with a bucket of cold water that he regularly throws on those two Dobermans. Okay? The point in this is you guys have to wear both those hats. Okay? And you have to make that mindset shift. All right. The last piece here that I'll chat about is, well, okay, yeah, I, I actually have one other thing I can add to, uh, property management. Um, when you're talking to property management companies, uh, you want a whole list of questions and stuff, but, and there's some good ones in my book, but a couple of high-level ones that, that I want to point out to you. One is, if you're buying properties under, say, 50 or 60 units, if you're, if you're 70 units or higher, you have your own on-site maintenance person. So this doesn't come into play, this particular point. But if you're under 50 units, for example, you're going to rely on their maintenance infrastructure. Okay, You're going to rely on their contractors. Maybe they've got their own maintenance staff. And maintenance can be a real profit center for a management company. Okay, And, for example, they can hire somebody for 20 bucks an hour and bill them out for 75 so you want to dig into that, okay? Ask the questions. Do you upcharge the contractors? Do you, you know, do you do your, you have your own maintenance staff? What do you charge for each little piece? And just really dig into that so you don't get taken advantage of. And I, there are, most of property management companies are very scrupulous, but they've got to make money too. But you want to dig into that so you don't get taken advantage of. That's number one. Number two, there are some great property management companies out there that have not embraced technology, Okay. You need to check their digital dinosaurs, but they're good property management companies. You want to check their mobile website. Can you, if you've got your 25 unit, can they drive up? Can somebody, a millennial, pull up in the front of it, go on their phone and do and see floor plans? Can they see a virtual tour? Can they apply for a unit online? Because if they can't, you're going to lose them. Okay, and, and you're eliminating. Gosh, in this day and age, I mean, look around. Everybody's got a phone in their hand. Probably 70 percent of the people. So make sure they've got a good online presence. Um, that's it. That's all I got. Now, I, that's it about multifamily. I could keep going, but I just wanted to scratch the surface with you guys. We've only got one mic, so I know there's going to be some questions, and I want to start, so we're just going to have to do a little bit of sharing of the mic here because we've only got this solitary mic. But one of the frequent questions that we get 
is when you're doing syndications, there's this you're really trying to plant seeds prior to actually procuring a property. You're wanting some investor, some idea of investors that are lined up before you actually make an offer. So how are those conversations going with potential investors? What are you saying to them to sort of make them feel more comfortable with what you're doing? What are some of the bullet points that you would you would cover with them? Okay, if you're brand new, this is the whole reason I started with branding. This is the whole reason I told you about those two websites, okay? Like I, I don't own any mobile home parks, so I align with someone that does. You have to do the same thing. So that if you align with someone, they you let the, you let them see your passion. You align with someone that owns some property, and you bring them onto your team. You give them five, ten percent, whatever, to be a sponsor. Then we own X number of properties. This is what we've done because you are now a team. It's we, okay? And you can speak to their experience and what they've done to lend yourself some credibility. And that's kind of the only way you can do it when you're brand new. Okay, but then once you've done your own couple of deals and you don't have to do it that way anyway, but that's the that's the way to start. And then listen, you develop an elevator pitch. You find a property that's a great deal and you say these are the kinds of deals we're seeing. If you if we ever find one, are you interested? Are you, you know, are you looking for a return? You develop an elevator pitch. You, everybody knows what that is, right? That what you can say down the traveling down an elevator in about a minute. And if they hold still long enough, they better know what it is you do. And so I want to say something foundational here. If you're not sure if you love this multifamily business, learn to love it, okay? Associate pleasure with it because if you don't love what you do, that passion is not going to come out. How you're going to influence people is your competence first, foundational. You have to be competent because that competence will equate to confidence, okay? And then that confidence will allow you to influence people. But foundational to that is you have to be passionate. You have to inspire them. You have to, you know, when you're talking about real estate, you need to get flushed in the face because you freaking love it, okay? And 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 so, again, if you don't love it, learn to love it. Associate pleasure with it mentally. I know that sounds foo-foo, but it works. It associate, associate c- compare it to hunting for treasure, okay? You're hunting for treasure because you really are, okay? But... And if you can't learn to love it, go do something else because life's too freaking short. I'm just telling you, okay? It just is. And I started my podcast and, you know, I started taking free calls from my listeners and I got so much pleasure out of that that I created courses and coaching and all that stuff, which I swore I'd never do, but I love it. And, you know, I was telling my kids, do what you love and work is play. And I wasn't eating my own cooking. My investment team still thinks I'm nuts, but but I love it. I'm doing what I love. I'm here tonight. I mean, I'm, I don't feel good. I'm on antibiotics, and I'm I'm still here because I love doing this, and I love adding value to people. So the 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 point is learn to love it because then you can influence people, and that's a long qu- answer to your question. But that's that's how you influence people with your passion and your ability to inspire, and 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 they see your love of it, and they're like, okay, there's something going on here. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. This is Adrian Smoot. And uh, first, thank you, Eric and Stephen, for bringing Rod in here to speak and educate us. I only came for sure. <laughs> well, thank you even more then. What would you say I should do first? I'm single family to jump into the small multifamily. Maybe it's a limiting belief, but I've been looking more at the eight unit the 10 unit, the smaller ones, but the management concerns me on these smaller units. And I, I have learned a few things tonight, but what would you see the, the best advice? That it's such a small unit, I can't bring anyone on and I have to hire a company. Okay. Okay. And, and there's nothing wrong with hiring a company for an eight unit. There are a lot of semi-retired brokers out there that would do a phenomenal job. You know, you get one person in one of the units that, that gets $200 off their rent to pick up the trash, keep an eye on things, show units, you know, uh, and, and, and keep, you know, be your eyes on the property. And then you have a broker that rents units and, and calls a contractor if something needs to break. You have to do some due diligence and find someone that you can trust and, and, and keep an eye on them initially. But but you're not gonna have any. You don't be afraid of that at all. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And and so what do you do to start? Um, 
I kind of went through it. I mean, you start the relationships, you, you decide on an area, you, you, you start, in, and it's relationships. Just get out there and, and you start, oh, I forgot to share something with you guys, something important. Okay, repetition is the mother of skill, okay? The more you do something, the better you become, right? Okay, you want to be evaluating a lot of deals, because you'll get good at it. And those of you that are like me that hate numbers, just do it anyway, okay? Your magnificent life is on the other side of comfort. You have to get uncomfortable, okay? And if you're if you're outgoing and a type A personality that's a fire ready aim guy like me that's made every mistake in the book, I get uncomfortable by doing deal analysis. If you're an introvert that loves the spreadsheets and can, you know, be locked in a room on their computer for days, you get uncomfortable going out and making relationships. Get uncomfortable because that's where that's where the quality of your life is. Your the quality of your life is in direct proportion to your ability to get uncomfortable. Okay, um, but repetition is the mother of skill. So to become very good at analyzing deals, you're going to have to have a lot of them come across your desk. What you're going to find is if you contact a broker on LoopNet. Um, they're going to send you a package, okay? And that package is going to be 95% pro forma, meaning what they think the property will do, which is toilet paper, okay? The banks like it, but that's about it. You need the real numbers. You want to know what the property has done historically, income and expenses. And unfortunately, it's only about 5% of what you're going to get. And and until you have the property under contract and you're in due diligence, that's when you get all the real backup. And so what I'm going to recommend you do, and I've got a list of them in my book, but you can just Google, Google commercial real estate auctions, okay, and sign up for all of them. Have these multifamily deals coming at you because what's different about an auction, if you bid at an auction and you're successful, it's your deal. If you back out, you lose a lot of money, okay? So you have to do all your due diligence ahead of time. And unfortunately, you're doing due diligence on a property you're not even sure you're going to get, okay? So it's typically haphazard due diligence. But because of that, typically, their packages are much more complete, Okay, you're going to get more financial data. They'll throw everything in there that they have, appraisals, surveys, things that will help you learn the business more. And it's just a better place to learn. Does that make sense? Now, a couple caveats. Do not take down an auction property unless you have me or somebody like me looking over your shoulder because sellers will put properties up for auction to hide defects, hoping that they'll slip through. Okay, and because you have a short due diligence fuse, just don't do it. Trust me, it, 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 until you know this business, don't do it in, unless you've got somebody looking over your shoulder. So that's number one. Um, number two, realize that when they put up a property on auction, they have a very low opening price by design to get you excited, to get you there to bid and hopefully overbid. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Um, one last tip, use a separate email address because they'll drive you crazy. So set up a separate email. And, they'll, and you, the package will still have a pro forma because they can't help themselves, but you'll get a lot more financial data. So it's a better place to learn. And if you're going to do this, immerse yourself in it, not just the relationships. You've got you've to do the relationships, Adrian, and you've got to evaluate deals. Okay, that's how you want to get going in this business. Those are the two big things, okay? And, and, and that's uh, how you get going. Any other questions? Yeah, you want to come up so they can hear it in the mic? Thank you, first of all, for coming and sharing with us. My name is Jason Maestas, and my question is about direct mailing. I've, uh, I've got a list from the county and trying to reach out to owners directly, but I didn't get a very good response rate. I'm not sure if I'm getting there because I tried sending to their home address instead of the yeah, LLC. You broke it up. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, so I could find the LLC and some of the managing members, but could you elaborate more on how you get to the decision maker? And I guess finding their address and how to reach them directly. Well, we get their address from the Secretary of State's office because they have to list their home address typically. It's in the operating documents. But you got to drill into it. I mean, that's why we don't do it. I pay, I have six virtual assistants in the Philippines that are full time. They speak English. They work 40 hours a week. And the, I have eight actually, but six of them I pay a dollar 93 an hour. Okay. I have six people working for under 12 bucks an hour. But 
I mean, you can do it yourself, but it's pretty mind-numbing work. But you got to dig in. You've got to find their home addresses. You mail them there. Um, and, but, but I will tell you, repetition is the key here, okay? Um, but you've got to hit them when they're motivated. I tell a story on, on my podcast um, about a guy that made a hundred grand wholesaling a multifamily deal. Everybody in this room knows what wholesaling is, right? You probably, if you're in this room, you probably do. Okay, flipping a contract. Well, I probably shouldn't say it publicly because I told him I wouldn't. Okay, <laughs> let's just say the guy that did that is a very close family member of mine. Okay, but he just didn't want me to say it was him on the podcast. But the point is, he did a mailer just like you're doing. Okay. Caught a guy at the right time. Guy was asking 1.7 million. It was a, it was a, it was an apartment building on Bee Ridge Road in Sarasota, four blocks from my office, 38 unit or something like that. Asking 1.7. He put it under contract for 1.1. The guy accepted it, put it on LoopNet for 1.2 and changed and sold it in about four or five days. That's my, it, my point in that was, which really wasn't answering your question, but it was, it, the point is, if you're going to do direct-to-seller marketing, make sure you've got some people like in this room that are end buyers that you can ultimately possibly wholesale to as well because there'll be deals you either don't want to do or can't do. So make sure you set up those connections as well. But back to your question, you know, we're blessed that I have access to um, some software that can, can get us phone numbers because we're going to do an outbound call campaign as well. You can get one, and I don't remember the name of it. It's kind of a pain and it costs some money. Um, I mean, they're free resources online, but they're not very good. But you can get access, but it costs some money. I, and I don't know the name of it. If you give me your card, I'll see if I can find it for you. Um, but to get the actual phone numbers. Uh, well, tr yeah, well, of course. Yeah, this is different than that. That's TransUnion. TransUnion, I don't know if they do phone numbers. Do they do phone numbers? Oh, they do. Okay, well, there you go. So maybe maybe them. But, but you have to kind of – you have to – I hate the word weasel, but you kind of got to weasel into it because they want to make sure you're you're using the numbers for the right reasons. So it's it's just okay. What are you going to do? TLO, TLO. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Like that's who we use. Okay, that's who we use because I, I own a litigation support company, another business that I own. It's people don't really know much about, but I, I it's a ten million dollar company with forty employees, and we have access to that. Um, that soft that database. So that's what we use. Yeah. We have any more questions, Greg? Greg? How you doing, Rod? This is Greg Rad, one half of Rafford Homes LLC, uh, podcast one twenty five. But I want to ask you. I, I'm a I'm a retired military guy, U.S. Army, and I've been investing in single family houses. And I listen to you quite often. And he always said, "Do not invest in single family houses." And um, could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. All right. That's, that's, I'm, you're making me go, you're making me go to that painful place. Well, I've had 2,000 houses, okay? I've owned 2,000. I'm not exaggerating. I started with 500 in Denver, a few hundred in Memphis, which I don't even want to talk about, and then over, you know, I don't know, 13, 1400 here. And I wouldn't do it again. And I wouldn't do it again because, now, let me give you a caveat, okay? Here in Florida, of course, you've got high taxes, you've got high insurance. All my properties were, you guys know, from like Bonita Springs to Hernando County, okay? You guys all know that. Uh, and everywhere in between. So logistically, it was a nightmare, okay? It was just, it was just not logistically manageable because, you know, I'd go and, you know, if you've got an apartment building and you've got a maintenance issue, you send a guy, you can stockpile parts, everything's the same, the appliances are the same, the HVAC is the same, you know, same plumbing parts, all that. You can stockpile parts. So, but, but you go to a house, I send a maintenance guy from Sarasota, drives an hour to Tampa, you know, he goes, sees what's wrong, then he's got to go find a Lowe's, then come back, uh, and then maybe he needs some more parts. And what could take 30 minutes in an apartment complex takes all day at, you know, at a house. So now, if you've got all your houses that are in a very tight geographic area, you can make it work. I mean, I could, I could have made it work in Denver for sure. Okay. But, but why? Why, why wouldn't you just buy a fourplex or a fiveplex or a 10 unit? Okay. It's the same amount of work. And then, and then it's exponentially more lucrative and it's safer. I mean, if you have a house and you're empty, you're hundred percent vacant. You have a duplex, you're 50% vacant. You have a fourplex, you're only 25% vacant. Makes a big difference. So that's why. 
And, and so listen, I love houses. I flipped houses. I made a lot of money flipping houses and, uh, I never wholesale, but I flipped, um, I rent, you know, obviously buy and hold, um, but I got I got the memo. <laughs> I got the memo, you know, because my in 2008 when everything was crashing, my multifamily was cash flowing. Except my dumbass cross collateralized it, so it all went away. Okay, so sorry about the the a bomb there. My dumb beep. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so um, um, yeah, you're welcome. Any any other questions? Pardon my voice. Uh, Kyle Knopf, uh, for those of us that are looking to break into multifamily and are building relationships with financial friends and potential sponsors, can you provide just some key guidelines for the liquidity, the net worth, and the experience that you had talked about earlier that we should kind of look for? Well, it, 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 it all relates to what size property you're going after because the bank will require a net worth equal to the loan amount and um, oh God, I'm just having a brain dump on the liquidity. Just check with a commercial broker on the liquidity requirement. The commercial brokers are right. There you go. There, right? Yeah, I, there's, a, there's a requirement. Robert handles all that for me or I'd be able to answer that question. Yeah, it, that's, that, sounds, that sounds right. And, and as far as experience, if they've signed on a Fannie Mae or Freddie Bank loan, they have the experience, okay? Um, but what's great is if let's say you get a high net worth doctor or somebody that has no experience, you can get a Freddie Mac loan and bring in a, a, a property manager that's acceptable to Freddie Mac and that will satisfy the experience requirement. Okay. So you can get past that one on that. But it, there's so many, listen, go on LinkedIn and find, find some guys that have a hundred units or 200 units and, and just, you know, let them know you're looking for deals. And if you find one, are they interested? And you'll find that, that, they're crazy not to because there's no ramification to them, you know? Um, so, did that answer you? I, I probably didn't. Oh, it did. Okay, good, buddy. Okay, so you bet. Hi, Rod. I'm Jillian Bandies. I'm a commercial contractor. And I live in the city of St. Pete, which is considering converting some of their single-family lots to multifamily lots, two, three, four units. What would you say as an investor, would you like that kind of deal, putting in multifamily in the midst of single-family units? Awesome question. And, and... Something that I think is a real opportunity, okay, may not be on those particular lots, depends on what you can get them for. But the opportunity is right now the rents are so great that I believe there's a real opportunity to develop to rent, okay, not to develop to sell. You're developing apartments to rent and hold long term. And Here's a play. Here, I'm, let me give you. I, I did a I did a podcast interview on this with a developer, and we kind of got into this. But here's a play you can make. You go out there and you find land that's zoned multifamily that's owned 100. percent I mean, it's free and clear, okay? And you develop a relationship with that seller. And you say, hey, listen, it's, you're sitting on this. How about I develop it? You get the percentage of the deal based on the value of that property. And that likely is enough to go get financing. If they throw the property in, it's not going to require much cash. And it's a real opportunity where, where you can put a deal together. Now, you've got to, you know, align yourself with the builder and, and well, you're a builder, you're a contractor. So there you go. And I've been talking about this with my friend Ralph, who owns a building company in Tampa that, you know, I just haven't had the bandwidth to do it, but we've been talk, we've been threatening to do it for five years just to, you know, put a team on finding those, the land, starting those, rela- our, our, our hitting these people up, seeing if they're interested in selling, and then develop with them in a partnership where they utilize the land for the equity in the deal, meaning the down payment, the, the out-of-pocket money. And it's just a sweet way to, to, to do a development. So consider that. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's, that's I mean, I, me, I'm all about keeping, keep, you know, OPM, other people's money. And so that's why I, I propose that as, a, as an option. But no, I absolutely believe in, in, in developing to rent right now. Absolutely. Because the rents are so fantastic. And you being a contractor, you're in the catbird seat because, you, you know, you've got, you know, the, the 20% or, you know, whatever it is, you probably a lot more than that. You just don't, can't, say it, can't say it publicly. <laughs> My name is Brad Regary. I just moved from Denver, um, flipped in Denver, basically, just moved about a month ago. I'm trying to get into buy and hold. So as I've understood, as least, at least in Denver, as it was, the cost of building was so far out 
just crazy in Denver. I couldn't even like people were popping tops, right? Um, they were you know knocking down. Uh, sure. Well, Denver's nuts. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah if I still had the, those five hundred houses. If I still had them, I'd be netting. What did I? T- what did I tell you on that? Half a million a month net. Half a million a month. Yeah, that's yeah. Yes. But you think this market's hot enough to be able to build into instead of buying something that's already existing, maybe that possibly you could buy at 50 a unit or 30 a unit? I, I believe it is. Now, obviously, you're going to have to have floor plans and blueprints where you combine the, you know, the, um, uh, the water and the sewer lines, uh, you know, backup kitchens to each other, and you do everything you can to minimize construct you be as efficient as you can but if you align yourself with someone like her because that you know there's blue sky in there and you and you go out there and find free and clear land i absolutely believe there's an opportunity and right. and, and, and and you're, and and you're and, and, and there, there you go and, and and you know you build them you battle proof them okay and you can you can do that fairly reasonably. I, you don't have to do granite, but you do, you know, uh, hard surface flooring. You 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 set it up to rent it. Okay, you you set it up that way. And and no, I think there's an opportunity. I really do because you know everything's so high right now. And and of course your stuff's going to be a class because it's brand new. So you can charge a premium because of that. So no, I, I absolutely believe there is. And that was Rod Khalif, motivational speaker, multifamily invest- investor, talking about. How to get your mind right for 2018 if you're, if you're an investor and or manager, asset manager of apartment complexes. Stephen, thoughts? Well, I enjoyed it very much. You know, you go to motivational speakers and the speaker might be very, might be very great. You come out and that you've got, you're just bubbling with enthusiasm, but then how do you apply it? So Rod was a mixture. He gave the motivational part, but then he has the knowledge experience and could help us focus on the real estate part of it and, and just lay out a plan. But what, and talking of planning, I mean, that's what he kept on emphasizing. You have to plan and you have to have goals. Yeah, and I would like to remind folks in the Tampa Bay area, we do have regular meetings. If you're interested in participating in those meetings with speakers like Rod in person, you can go to where, Stephen? You go to investfloridashow.com. And there you'll also get our archive of past shows. And uh, just it's just a wonderful encyclopedia now of information on real estate investing. Yep, a lot of a lot of information there. And you can sign up for our meetup group and Facebook and stay abreast of all of the events that we have going on here at the suites. You know, I'd like to mention also one other thing. We uh, uh, try to have these events at least uh, once every uh, three or four months. So you can get go ahead and get signed up there. And Stephen, is, I think that's about all for the day. Is there anything else um, before we let our listeners go? Nope. Have a good week and we'll see you at the next podcast. Guys, as always, we appreciate the time that you invest with us. And until next time, hasta la vista. You've just listened to the Invest Florida podcast with Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Join us every week for actionable real estate investment ideas. And of course, visit our website at www.investfloridashow.com for more shows and tips on how to earn a cash flow in the real estate market in Florida. While hosts and producers of the Invest Florida show have no reason to doubt the validity of comments of our guests, we do not warranty their accuracy. Please check with your legal, financial, and tax advisors before entering into any investment. Returns will vary from person to person and deal to deal based on unique circumstances. All information expressed in this show is for educational purposes only. Opinions of the guests are not necessarily shared by the hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show.